Hello, everybody, and welcome to Jake Cisco on writing featuring Armin <laughs> Shimmerman. Uh, actually, uh, this is Virtual Trek Con with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We have an extremely special guest, one of our favorite people, a great friend of the show, Mr. Armin Shimmerman. Nice. Um, I felt like I should salute back when you did that. That was a very firm <laughs> one. It was good. That's because uh, I was Starfleet for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, we're going to be talking all about writing, the art of writing, and specifically Armin's new book, which is just amazing from what we hear so far, but it's just barely out. So we're looking forward to that. How are you today, Armin? I'm, I'm very good. I'm very eager to talk about the book. I'm always eager to talk to the two of you as well. So thank you for this opportunity. And well, thank you for saying nice things about the book. <laughs> well, so far, that's what we're seeing all over Twitter. Thank you. Um, yeah. Siraki said he's eager to talk about the book. So that eliminates the first six questions. Let's just get to the book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, let's get to the book. Yeah, I think that's let's start there. Um, tell us about the book. <laughs> okay. Um, so, f uh, for those of you, there is some uh, sort of nice uh, backstory about the book. I actually yeah. started writing this book about twenty twenty five years ago. So I was doing the writing in my trailer as I was waiting for Sirach to get his lines right uh, on stage. Oh, wow. um, That's a lot so, of time. So you almost, you almost finished the book then. This is yeah, the Exactly. <laughs> um, so I started then. Uh, it's been a project that I, it's been very dear to my heart. There have been years when I didn't write at all, but you want to know a little about the book. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I know you two know, my passion is of Shakespeare and Elizabethan history and Elizabethan literature and, and Elizabethan morality. And so my book is about that. It's an Elizabethan mystery, sort of Le Carre meets, uh, meets uh, Elizabethan England and, uh, and specifically Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night. So what I do is wow. I mix history and fantasy together. Uh, everything in the book, except for the Twelfth Night characters, uh, is historically correct. There isn't anything. The tables are historically correct. The bookshelves are historically correct. The food is uh, historically correct. Um, the calendar, which is very important um, um, at that time, the calendar is correct. Because at that time, here's something to be learned. Um, in 1583, which is when my book takes place, there were two calendars in the, in the, in the uh, European world. One was the, let me get this right, Yes, the Gregorian calendar, which was proposed by the church, by Pope Gregory. And there was the Julian calendar, which was the calendar supposedly started by Julius Caesar. So most of Europe was on the Gregorian calendar, which was 10 days behind the Julian calendar. And, uh, and England was on the Julian calendar. Why? This has nothing to do with the book, but it is part of the book. Um, because the English were Protestant and, and a lot of Southern Europe was Catholic and the Protestant leaders of England wanted nothing to do with the Catholicism of the church. And so they refused to accept the, what everyone knew to be the better calendar, um, because it was Catholic, but okay. So that's tangential to my book, but that's the kind of things you learn. This, this is, is after the Reformation. Is that this is taking place after the Reformation? This is taking place in 1583. So uh, after the Reformation. So uh, my book is about a historical character named John D. Doctor John D. Who was a polymath. He was a great mathematician. He was uh, a great astrologer. Uh, he helped with exploration. Uh, he 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 was one of the advocates for the Gregorian calendar in England. He himself had done research to show that the, that the, the Catholic Church's calendar was correct. There are many things that he may even have been the, the architect, one of the architects of the Globe Theater for Shakespeare. Um, he was also a notorious, what's the word? Um, uh, Sirac um, is thinking three letters right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> B-I-G. Yeah. He, 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 studied, he studied white magic. That's the, that's the plebeian way to say it. And, 
and he was eager to communicate with angels. In fact, he wrote a dictionary about the angelic language. This is a man who was respected. This is not some crank. And he, he wrote a, a, a dictionary about the angelic language. Anyway, because of his what's called hermetic practices, because of his hermetic practices, he was considered a witch. Mm. Um, even though he was, a, he was an associate of the Queen's, an associate of all the major people in the English government but he was considered a witch. And, um, and because of that, one of the, one of the primary uh, officials of the, Eng of the English court gets him to go on a mission to, to check on the loyalty of a particular count who is Catholic, uh, who is governing one of the islands in the, in the English Channel. And the English government is concerned that that, 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 that island is a halfway house of bringing Catholic priests into England to, to uh, hold mass for Catholics in England. Mass was forbidden in England during Elizabethan times, or at least after a certain period of Elizabethan times. Right. And so the church was concerned that their people were not celebrating mass. And so this island may or may not be a halfway station, and it's John Dee's responsibility to find out if uh, the Count is loyal to the Queen. In the process of getting ready for that trip, that investigation, he meets a very young William Shakespeare, and uh, that's what the book is about. And, and, okay. and, and both of them go to this island, which happens to be the island of Valyria, where the characters of Twelfth Night from the play Twelfth Night exist. Wow, okay, Sirach, I know that uh, you and I, we love history so much that while Armin was saying this, we got each got like 10 questions lined up. So I'm just jumping in first before you, <laughs> because yeah, please. My, my first thought uh, a, a couple minutes ago was, you were mentioning all the research that you must have done. I feel like this is the kind of book where the research took at least as long as the writing. And I, my, my first little bit I want to know about was you mentioned the food. What, what specifically was different about the food? And on a grander scale, can you just tell us about the, uh, the researching process? And sure. That you may have learned. Thank God we live in a period of time when you have the internet. Right. Uh, otherwise, I would have spent all my days in the library. So luckily, there are so many sites that cover so many of these details. But, the, but there, are, there are things about the, the consumption of ale, for instance, which was gigantic. The, the amount of ale that, that Englishmen drank was, was tremendous. Why they weren't drunk all the time, perhaps they were, um, I don't know. But for instance, I had to do research into uh, what kind of food is eaten in the English Channel. So I found out that um, um, I think they're called omers are a particular uh, a big food uh, in the English Channel. So that's part of the food. Um, uh, I had to do a lot of research into Elizabethan government and how that was done. Uh, had more is because this book is a lot about religion and, and the conflict between Catholicism and, Pro and Protestantism at that time. I had to do a lot of research on that. This is why the book took 20, 25 years to write. And in the meantime, I was doing that other thing. I was you know, acting, memorizing lines every day. Yeah. That, <laughs> every once in a while. Every once in a while. So, so I, I want to understand, this is like a true story or based on a true story? Yeah. No, it's not a true story. So oh, it is okay. a fantasy. And, and as much as there's history in it, I hope to right. God, you all know me, I hope to God there's also a lot of humor in it. I hope <laughs> you laugh as well as be, you know, be educated by it. it it's a, it, it, uh, everyone who's read it so far has told me that it is a very uh, funny book. It's not funny all the time, of course, because it is a mystery. But, but there are lots of funny moments in it. Um, so it's a f fictional character based on historical facts. Right? It's Shakespeare and D are historical characters. And everything connected okay. to the two of them is historical. Everything that's connected to the English government and the mission and, and, the, and the conflict between the religions, all of that is historical. It's just that the characters that they meet in Illyria are the characters from Twelfth Night. And of course, those characters are not historical. So I'm trying to mix history and fantasy and humor together. Um, so my first question when I was hearing this story is, uh, you had so much on your plate when you were doing DS9, 
uh, you know, working those hours plus doing other shows, uh, you know, Buffy mm -hmm. and everything else. Right. Uh, where did the time to even get this idea on paper come from? And where did the inspiration for the idea come from? Thank you, Sirach. So um, I found out that sitting in my trailer got to be rather boring uh, for the first couple of years of Deep Space Nine. And, and I had lots of time. We all had not a great deal of time, but we had large swaths of time where we had nothing to do. Perhaps you were in school, so maybe you didn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, didn't have much, yeah. uh, but I had lots of time and certainly uh, sitting in a big rubber head uh, could be very frustrating. <laughs> so, the, so, so I had time to start to write, at least to start thinking about it. The plot certainly uh, was all made up by me. But how did the first idea come? Maybe people are not aware that prior to writing this book, I had written a trilogy called The Merchant Prince, um, which is also based on this gentleman, Dr. John Dee. Really? And yeah. And yes. so I'm, I'm very much fascinated not only by Shakespeare, but by John Dee. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> my first book of The Merchant Prince, there are three books of Merchant Prince, just as there will be three books of Illyria. Um, I was I co-wrote it with a wonderful writer um, whose name is Michael. Oh my God, I can't remember Michael's last name. Um, um, Michael. Anyway, we'll just call him Michael for now, and we'll hope that he doesn't catch this pod. He wants to remain anonymous. Yeah, he wants to remain. <laughs> yeah. anonymous. Um, yes. And um, I was sitting in Ireland, where he's from, and uh, and he said to me, "We should write a series of novels." about Shakespeare and Dee as Sherlock Holmes and Watson solving mysteries that eventually end up being Shakespeare's plays. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. That is a great idea. So um, after 25 years, <laughs> I've written one of them. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think there'll be any others, but, um, but uh, that's where I got it. I got it from Michael. Oh my God, I can't remember Michael's last name. Um, so uh, that's where the idea came from. And I, I always thought it was a great idea. Michael um, dropped out of my life as soon as the first book of Merchant Prince was printed. I've, I've seen him on and off, but not very often. So um, um, I did all the writing my, by, my, by myself. Mm -hmm. Kitty sometimes would do a little editing, but um, uh, most of the writing is mine. All of the writing, except for the editing. Uh, how did you find yourself in Ireland, if I may ask? How do you yeah. think I found myself in Ireland? <laughs> I was there at a convention. Uh, okay. right. and, uh, and because Michael and I knew each other when we were writing a book together, uh, I came to visit Michael. And we, we met at a, a wonderful uh, eatery that is world famous also, which I've forgotten. And it was one of the great meals of my life. But it also was an opportunity for Michael and I to sit down after we'd eaten and, and discuss our future together. And this is what our future uh, seemed to be at the time. Mm -hmm. Armin, have you considered or have you already dabbled in writing sci-fi or fantasy where you don't need to research anything? Nobody can say, that's not historically accurate. <laughs> and you can just write whatever pops in your head and have that oh, kind of fun. Ryan, I, I did mention it earlier. Merchant Prince is that. Merchant Prince oh, it is. is a sci-fi trilogy. So I didn't say it was a sci-fi trilogy, but Merchant Prince is about this character, John D, who is an Elizabethan, a historical Elizabethan, who finds himself in the 22nd century. So it is indeed science fiction. We're, you're it. right. There are no restrictions. Nothing has to be researched. Everything could just come out of my mother wit. And uh, uh, is it easier? Yes, but it's not as enjoyable mm -hmm. because... I, as you must know about me, enjoy the research. So, so having to do the research uh, uh, is quite rewarding to me, and it inspires me to think of how to work within the framework of history. Right. Shout out to Wikipedia. Uh, we can spend hours just clicking around on that thing. Precisely. And I've visited it thousands of times. Mm. I have a question about the process. Um, are you writing down conceptually the kinds of things that you want, like scene by scene? Are you going overall? Uh, or are you just writing 
from beginning to end and just... I am writing from beginning to end. Um, for the most part, uh, it's just what comes out of my fingertips as I hit the keys. Um, and then I go back. Every writer knows this. Writing is rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. So the inspiration shows up the first day. And then you rewrite it and rewrite it. And sometimes you throw it all out and, oh, my God, that shit, let's get rid of it. Um, sometimes, and because you've, you've written one little paragraph, all of a sudden where you thought the story was going isn't going there anymore. Um, and now it's somewhere else, which is something I'm dealing with right now. Um, even though the book is published, um, the book yes. is, will, will, will come out uh, in bookstores on November the 5th which happens to be an English holiday. Um, it's called Guy Fox, Guy Fox Day. It also happens to be my birthday. So uh, uh, November the 5th, everybody. Um, and we will include all that information in the description box below of this video. So please, everybody, make sure to go check that out. Sorry, Armin, please continue. Sure, thank you, Ryan. Um, so, so I would say mostly it's I'm going bit by bit, but sometimes I go, I know somewhat in the near future, I want to write a scene about this. So the question is, how do I get from square A to square G? And, and, and then you have to sort of, okay, and I want G and I'm at A. So then you have to force yourself to write between the interstitial material between A and G. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes wow. me think of a couple of, uh, there, there's sometimes a crossroads in writing uh, and you kind of touched on it, which is, you think something's going in a certain direction, but then when you are following what is true to the characters you have created, sometimes those characters you have created, if you follow them, honestly, they're going in this direction. And as writers, you kind of have to constantly juggle how important is it that they get to this versus how important is it to let the characters lead. And sometimes, you can plug in the right things to get there anyway. Right. But have you found that one is more important than the other? Or do you, have you found a way to kind of juggle both that you think is fair? I think it's fair to say that I've juggled both. Um, sometimes it's, because it's a, it's a period mystery, sometimes you're writing and you do a little research and go, oh, no, that didn't happen for another 20 years. That didn't happen anywhere near 1583. So <laughs> that's gone because it has, for me, the criteria was it had to be historically correct. And, and um, so you have to throw things out. And, then, and again, it's the same thing. If I can't write about King Lear in this novel because that's way in Shakespeare's history. So I can't do that. That's not possible because this is a very young Shakespeare. This is a 16 year old Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, you are compelled by that as well. So yeah, you, it's a juggling act. You try to let the characters have their say, but at the same time, you, you sort of have a, you're the director and you want to see the scene go this way. Um, speaking of being the director, so you're coming, you have the background in stage and theater, you're doing film and television, and now you're, uh, well, not now, but you've been doing the literary part. Which part of the film and television and the stage informs you in the literary aspect? Does it change the way you frame things? Does it change the way you uh, direct the, the, uh, the book? Certainly, um, the, the classical plays that I have done almost all my life uh, certainly influence the book. For instance, I got a very nice review the other day saying that the language that I use sounds very Shakespearean. It's not difficult. It's, I don't use words that, you know, no one's going to understand. And I certainly am not making difficult period references, which is always a problem when you're watching Shakespeare. You don't get the references because they're 400 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I stay away from those. But still the patois of the way the characters speak, you could almost think you were listening to the language of a Shakespearean play. So to answer your question, Sirach, my experience on stage, both as an actor, as a director, uh, sometimes as a dramaturge, um, uh, all are influencing the way I write dialogue in the, in the play. And, and one would assume 
that my experience in front of the camera as an actor, having digested dialogue my entire career, that that is also informing me about how I want to put the dialogue together. To, you know, I've, I've learned to try to say less with more, or how do I put that wrong? To say more with less. With, there we go. Yeah, to just say, to, 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 to sort of say something that's concise as opposed to getting overboard about it, because that's what we have in scripts. Narrow it down less, 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 so that the so that you uh, you know it's better dialogue. No, that's really cool, and it makes me think. Did you sneak in any nods or Easter eggs to Shakespeare or Shakespearean many. characters? Many. There did are you put many. Some lines like an iambic pentameter, or some characters that remind you or have similar names. Well, uh, certainly the nods, because I'm dealing with characters from Twelfth Night and their characters in my novel, those are huge nods. Yeah. Sometimes uh, I sneak in a line or two from the play from Twelfth Night. Um, so anyone who's enormously familiar with Twelfth Night, and there are only three of us like that, <laughs> um, um, you know, they'll, they'll get a smile out of that. I'm trying to, like Shakespeare, who created humor for all the various tiers of society, I'm trying to, my humor should appeal to various types of per people, whether it's the pedant who knows a lot about Shakespeare, what it's the, whether it's the student who doesn't know very much about Shakespeare, but, is, but uh, wants to find out about his early years, which by the way, no one knows about his early years. Yeah, that was my reason. next question. Yes, that was my next question that you have Shakespeare at 16 and I, I don't know, you have to educate Nobody me, does. But... Nobody knows what Shakespeare was doing at 16. There are lots of wonderful guesses. This is my guess, this is my guess. Um, so, uh, but I'm trying to appeal to various levels of appreciation. Hmm. Just as Shakespeare did with his plays. There's humor for the, for the cheap seats, there's humor for the aristocratic seats. <laughs> Sirach, do you have any guesses as to what Shakespeare was doing at 16? It seemed like you, your mind was already working on that. We knew he was getting yeah. Anne Hathaway pregnant. That's all we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't know, but just being somebody who's been involved with, you know, uh, adult life at a young age, I figured that he would mm -hmm. have matured faster and younger than the average person just because of the, the his mind and how he thinks and what he sees and how he interprets what he sees. So I would ex expect that he was farther ahead of the curve than any other 16 year old who's just playing with toys. And, and he learns to grow up during the course of my novel. Um, he, he goes from a very young, uh, I give this away a little, it's in the very first page, so I'm not giving away very much. <laughs> uh, he goes from a very young actor writer to the Shakespeare that we know uh, by the end of the book. In, in the a maturation story. process, he grows up during the during the um, during the course of the novels. Uh, so, it, it, just just as far as maturation, just a historical fact. I'm full of those. Um, the average age of a Londoner in 1583 was 23. Wow! That if you got to be 30, you were an old man. Uh, wow. You were beyond the curve. This, of course, has to do with, with lots of children dying in, in childbirth, but, but it was rare for people to live beyond 40 or 50. Mm. Um, so in this, in this book, John D. is the older character. He's, he is the Sherlock the... Holmes character. He is the Sherlock Holmes. He is the one who is the mastermind who knows about mathematics, about symbols, uh, about uh, policy, uh, about uh, about the stars, about the calendar, uh, and Shakespeare is his Watson, who is tagging along, and eventually, as Watson does in the Sherlock Holmes stories, will write about the adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's brilliant. It's kind of like a prequel to what Shakespeare ended up becoming. Right. It's like telling the story of Shakespeare. What made Shakespeare Shakespeare? Um, do you think about um, having any of your work adapted on screen and turned into? <laughs> Only actors and people in the business ask me that. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a natural thing, you know? Yeah. It is a natural thing. It is a natural thing. Um, right now, I would just like to see this on people's shelves. 
Um, no, the answer is no. I, I have no expectation to see it made into a film or a, a 25 years in the making. I am enormously grateful to see this. I, I am enormously grateful that it's actually in print. Uh, yeah. This which, which to is me a, is, yeah. is huge, huge. Oh, it's, a, it's very huge. I mean, it's, it's bigger than my book, which is actually inside this envelope. Uh, <laughs> they will so, go. You have another 19 years to go. Uh, well, yeah, so give me some time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question for you. Uh, what's your favorite book? If you have to, if you have to Ooh, narrow it down. And, you, and you, can, you can do a two or three, but if you can narrow it down to one. Uh, one would have to say it's, it's a hard question, but it has an easy answer. Because I've spent my life uh, studying Shakespeare, one would have to say a collection of Shakespeare's plays is my favorite book. Uh, I suppose that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but there have been a lot of books in my life. And, and in fact, um, there are three books that affected this novel a great deal, but not in a good way. Um, there's a wonderful English writer, her name is Hilary Mantel. You probably know of her first book, oh, which the name is, hmm. Um, oh, this is just old age, I apologize. You're, you're watching. We'll look at it. So uh, any uh, guesses? Yeah, um, uh, they, made a, they made a Broadway show out of it. They made a movie out of it. They made a TV show, a TV a miniseries out of it. Wow. It's called, Hillary what's her name? Mantel. Her name is Hilary Mantel. Uh, anyway, let me tell the story and we'll, we'll get back to the title of, she wrote three books, Bring Up the Bodies, which, uh, uh, which is the third book, uh, which is the second book. Uh, the first one is huge, huge. Oh my God. Um, anyway, so when I read that book, whose, whose title I cannot remember, and that's terrible that I can't remember, um, I stopped writing for four years because she was writing about Thomas Cromwell, maybe that's a hint. Um, who was a historical character about, let's say, 30, 40 years before. Yeah, Shakespeare. it's Wolf Hall. Wolf Hall, thank you. Yeah, Wolf Hall. Um, when I read Wolf Hall, I stopped writing. I went, this book is incredible. Wow. And, and, and she does everything that I ever aspired to do. Why should I even attempt to, to write when Wolf Hall exists? I, so I just stopped. I just went, no, I'm, I'm, I, I can't compete with that. that. That's, you know, forget it. And then my brilliant wife, after a number of years, who was concerned that I wasn't writing anymore, said, it's not a competition, Armin. You don't have to write like Hillary right. Mantel. You can write your own book. And God bless Kitty. Um, so I started, I went back to the computer and started typing away. <laughs> but those three books, um, uh, her trilogy, the Wolf Hall trilogy, um, are, are some of my favorites because the writing and the period and, and the characters that, again, historical characters that she created are astounding, astounding. Armin, do you feel as though Wolf Hall kind of crippling your writing for that short time? Do you feel as though that's kind of karma for how you affected other actors when they saw you acting? Oh, I hope my acting didn't make it. <laughs> They're um, like, we can't compete with this guy, man. This is impossible. Um, I, I, I don't think so, Ryan. But, but uh, no, I, I, sh I hope I inspired people to, as Ciroc, would his work also would inspire people to go into our profession. I hope we don't. I'm only kidding. You don't have to answer that. That was just a compliment of, with, about I, I, your I acting skills. I understand that. I, I <laughs> first. Um, no, I, I hope I hope it inspired people just as uh, James Cagney inspired me to become an actor. Uh, but he didn't stop me from becoming an actor. He just inspired me. Inspired me. Um, um, if you were to have dinner with Shakespeare today, yes. Yes. What, oh would boy. Be, what would be some of the questions you would have for him? What did you do when you were a young man? <laughs> 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 Only tell me. <laughs> Just tell me that these years. I want to know. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I would ask him. Uh, one of the one of the things I would ask him. Question that no one has ever been able to answer in four hundred years. 
were you a Catholic or were you a Protestant? Oh. Um, because no one can really answer that. He was brought up Catholic, but he worked for the crown and you couldn't work for the crown. Uh, Life doesn't stop when we're recording. That's, <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. That's okay, life uh, keeps going. Uh, so there's that, but I, I think primarily, I, I would ask him just what you've asked me, which is what were your sources? What prompted you to write these plays? Right. What, what, what happened in your life that was the inspiration for Twelfth Night, for Hamlet, for Lear, um, for Henry V? Um, we sort of know what the inspiration was for Macbeth, but for the other plays, um, I, what were the inspiration for that? And because um, it is also a, a huge burning question for bardologists, that's what we call ourselves who study Shakespeare, um, uh, are there any missing plays? Are there any plays Ooh. that you wrote that we don't have? Because I sure would like to read those. Yeah. Wow, you want more. And would so, you like some more wine? That would be another question. I <laughs> no, I, I didn't understand. I didn't know that there was a mystery between, uh, behind whether he was a Catholic or Protestant. Huge, and, huge. And that none of that would show in his work whether he was leaning any particular way. And there are scholars who try to suss out whether there are clues in the work. Um, and there's scholars from both sides that advocate the Protestant side and advocate the, the Catholic side. The Catholic side is getting a big surge nowadays that, uh, that there's lots of secret Catholic hints in Shakespeare's plays, but, but there's no proof of that, just suspicions. Wow. What do you think it is, Armin? Do you have a guess? I don't have a guess. I, I will tell you this, I am not religious. My religion, is the theater. Mm. My religion is the actors I work with and the theater. Um, and so I want Shakespeare to be a lot like me, to not be tied up to one particular creed, but to be open to all creeds and to be in love with the people that I work with. Wish we're all like that, kind of. Um, you were talking about inspiration and I want to kind of expand that into just writing in general. Do you have any advice for people that are trying to write or people that are working on writing or kids that want to be writers, whether it's something that you've experienced or found throughout your writing process or advice or something that you've observed from other people? I will give you advice that Kitty gave me. Keep at it. Keep at it. Um, just keep Keep at it. Um, if it gives you pleasure, uh, don't worry about the publication. Don't worry about the afterlife after the writing. The, the, the means is what's important, not the ends, because the pleasure is in the writing. Everything else is just gravy. Uh, so keep at it. Enjoy yourself. Write. Go back and rewrite. Make Write the perfect sentence, write the perfect paragraph, write the perfect dialogue. Look at that. It, it may only take up a, a quarter of a page, but if it's perfect, you can be very proud of that. It's like as an actor, if you have one moment in a TV episode where you go, that's not bad. You can deal with all the rest of the stuff that's garbage. That one moment was worth it. I have a question about the process. Um, when I was writing um, music, I would get these lyrics in my head at the most random times, and I'd write them on napkins, and I'd write it on receipts, uh, and anywhere I could find a piece of paper. So um, does your inspiration come to you like that, in little jolts, where you're like, oh, I got to write down now? Or do you, are you one of the people that likes to sit down and say, you know, from this time to this time, or I have a sitting a place that I sit? I'm a lot like you, Ciroc. Um, <laughs> it, it, if it happens to me all of a sudden, uh oh, uh, yeah. and I've done it at three o'clock in the morning, right. I go out of bed, I go to the computer, and I write whatever that thing is in a place where I keep all that stuff. And then in the next morning, 
or if it's during the day, I immediately write for a sentence or two to go with that idea. It may just stay a sentence or two, or it may flesh out to be a chapter. Uh, but but no, the, when I get the inspiration, when it comes, I have to write it down because I'm I'm too old and too stupid. I'll forget it if I don't write it down immediately. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've learned that lesson because we've all done that thing where we're so inspired by something we think this is such a perfect idea. I'll totally remember it tomorrow. Right. And you do not. <laughs> the next day it is gone, whether it's a lyric or a song, guitar lick or what. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Uh, and I can only tell you as you get older, it's gone faster. <laughs> and it stays away from it. It's longer. Um, so, yeah, I have to write it. And I do it all the time. I'll read something. I'll think of something. I'll hear something on the TV. Something flashes across my head. Go, oh, that's an idea. And then I immediately, immediately I force myself. Got to go write it down now. Otherwise, I will forget. Uh, I do, do, do you think that the stories Shakespeare was writing were made up in his head? No, no, we're, we're very sure of that, Sirach. There's only one okay. play that he made up in his head. Mm. Okay. Uh, and that's uh, Titus Andronicus. Uh, all, the other all the other plays are based on previous uh, works. Everything is based on previous works. That is a given. Uh, 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 Titus is the only one that he made up in his head. Um, you can't fault him for that. That's what other playwrights were doing as well. And, and he had the, you know, a major responsibility to crank out those plays. He often cranked out two or three plays a year. So he needed inspiration it, 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 to start the process. But why, why this story? With all the things that he's reading, why, why is he writing this story now? Why? What, why is he doing that? That's the question, going back to your question what I would ask in, in, uh, at dinner. Why did you write this then? What, what, was, what prompted this? But, but no, most of the stories, 99% of them, uh, there are 37 plays that we know of, so 36 of them were prompted by earlier works. Oh, wow. So, Armin, we only have a few minutes left with you, and this has been awesome, by the way. This is always such yeah. a great time talking with you. Um, this book is done you're going to, and, and you deserve to reap the benefits and kind of rest on your laurels for a minute and pat yourself on the back. Do you have a new project or new projects that have been waiting for a while or that you're, you're considering jumping into next? Well, yes, yes and no, yes and no. Okay, so 25 years, <laughs> it was a very big book. It was a huge book. Uh, I wrote, wrote way too much. Even though I cut back and cut back and come back, it was a huge book. So when I approached the publisher, the publisher very wisely said to me, um, you don't have one book, you have three books. Mm -hmm. And so I said, oh, okay. He said, so you have to, before we print this, you have to figure out a way for two cliffhangers to end the first two books, uh, and then you can have the third book. So I said, okay. So that took me about a month to figure out the two cliffhangers. And without giving anything away, there's a cliffhanger um, at the end of this book, um, somewhere on the last page here. Um, and so what I'm doing now is writing the interstitial materials that takes us from the cliffhanger, which was never part of my original idea when I sold the book, um, to back to get us back to the story that I had originally written. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I've written about 26, 27 pages and probably need another 12 to get me back to where, uh, where I originally was, was at. So that's that's why I say yes and no. I'm I'm very very much involved in writing that interstitial material, and then because the second book isn't coming out for a little while, uh, as soon as that material is written, then like I said before, then I want to go back and look at the second book, and and continue to rewrite it, polish it, polish it, polish it, polish it. I still have time. I was polishing the first book up until two days before they said, that's it, you can't polish anymore. <laughs> uh, 
because I'm a perfectionist. So, so I will write that interstitial material and then I will polish and polish and polish and polish and eventually um, get to the third book and polish there too. That, that cliffhanger, I don't have to write interstitial material a, a little bit, but not compared to this one. Uh, where is the book going to be available? How can people get a hold of it? So there are two places that you can, right now it's in pre-sales. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to my website, should be easy to find, Um and, and there's a link there under the category of shop, um, which will take you to my publisher, which is Jump Master Press. So you can go to my website, and if you go there now, between now and Guy Fawkes Day, November the 5th, uh, you get a 20% discount on the purchase of the book. And you get an option also, because they're no fools, uh, you get an option for me to sign it, I believe, for free. Uh, you get a personalized uh, copy. Wow. Of it. Oh, wow. So, um, so that you can get it on my website, or you can go to www.jumpmaster press. And, and get the same options, same discount, the same option to get a, a signed copy uh, at Jump Master Press. Right now, those are the only two places between now and November the 5th. After that, of course, it'll be on Amazon.com. It'll be in your bookstores. Uh, it'll be wherever my publisher can get it into. Great. And we'll definitely have that information in the description box below. But you guys... The value of Armin's signature is higher than <laughs> it sounds oh, yeah. because let me just tell you, Armin, you have you put the most effort into your autograph, into your signature than anybody I've ever seen. It's Some because there's like, more letters than anybody else. Yeah, it takes up more space than it takes up more space. <laughs> but see, that would that would have made you just scribble. When we have, when we have yeah. the pictures of everybody, Armin has taken up so much space. There's no place to put anybody else's name. <laughs> Not to mention, sometimes you draw a picture. And, uh, yes, and sometimes wow, I draw a picture. There's even more here. Yeah. But um, but no, that's that's awesome. I'm 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 so. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised because you're so talented and you've always shown us um, the best of you. Um, this is just another example of you putting your skills and your talent to use for the benefit of all of us to enjoy and, and, and have fun and learn. So thank you for that. Um, thank you, sir. High compliment. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's from the heart. And they do say, write what you know. And you clearly very clearly know your stuff. Yes, I, I was just having lunch with Marina Sirtis just before <laughs> we started. And she said something, you don't know anything about English history. She said that to me. I said, oh. excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. I know quite a bit about English history. <laughs> and she said, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I know what food they were eating. That's uh, right. Uh, that in 1583. So watch it. It wasn't Greek food. And it wasn't. Greek. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Wow. Well, Armin, uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We will include all that information. We're looking forward to the book and the second and third books in the trilogy. Very much looking forward to that. So this first book is Illyria. Is that right? No. Yeah, yes and no. Here, let me put it up again. If you notice, the title says, if you can read it, uh, mm -hmm. it says Illyria, but the first book's actually Illyria colon Betrayal of Angels. Betrayal of Angels. Um, and uh, the, the title, not to give anything away, has a lot to do with John D. As you, as you read the book, you'll find out more about John D and his relationship with angels. Mm -hmm. Got it. So wow. it's... For those of you nerds like myself, it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings trilogy. This is Fellowship of the Ring. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, anyway, but thank you very much, Armin. This has been great. We really appreciate you taking the time away from your lunch with other awesome people. And uh, everybody else at home, check us out on the next one. Check out Armin's book. It's going to be everywhere, and it's going to blow your Shakespearean mind. Thank you very much. <laughs>